Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Fake news. Why is it such a problem in the Islamic world? Why is it such a problem specifically when we talk about apologetics, when we have da'is on the internet, at Speaker's Corner, given evangelism, and they can't help but say things that we just know are complete nonsense, like in any sense. Anyone, whether you're Muslim, Christian, Jew, atheist, you can tell that this is just fake news at its heart, but they still do it, even though they've been caught out, and, they, and, and caught out in just the best way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Exhibit A. Now, this video I found by chance. I, I found it because I actually was looking into some scholarly stuff, and I wanted to go to the Twitter page of a well-respected scholar, Marin Van Putin, and I wanted to just check out some things he had to say, but I found a very specific and interesting post, and it was talking about a good friend that we've all seen online, because for some reason he just keeps popping up as some sort of authoritative Islamic source. Bobby's perspective. He made a video a few months back where he claimed that Marin Van Putin, a respected scholar of linguistics, particularly in the area of Quranic Arabic, that he was paid two million, two million big, big buckaroos, to evaluate the Quran from a linguistic perspective and to see if there was any mistakes. And if there are any mistakes, to document them, otherwise to publish his findings. This video says that he found no mistakes, <laughs> that he basically proved the Quran has been preserved in the highest sense, and this was some sort of new amazing thing that everyone should know about, and people should just rush in droves to become Muslim, because this scholar has just proved there are no mistakes in the preservation of the Quran. Yeah, so um, how do you think this went? I'll give you a clue. He did not say any of this, <laughs> and uh, he he got a bit upset about it, and and I think rightfully so. You know, if someone's quoting you and they're they're using you to make viral videos, because this video went viral not just from Bobby's perspective, but from other channels as well. The Muslim Paradigm, I think, is another channel that originally shared this, as far as I can tell. But from there, tons of people have made content from this Muslim channels that are perfectly okay with lying to their predominantly Muslim audience, because there needs to be a win for Islam now. It's taken too many L's over the years. There has to be some good news. What is that good news? Marin Van Putin, he's going to save the day. So let's watch the video and let's see the kind of things that they're saying. Alhamdulillah. Guys, today we're going to react to scholar paid 2 million to find mistakes in the Quran, shocked by what he found. This is Professor Marin Van Putin, who received a whopping 2 million euros grant by the European Research Council whopping to indeed. linguistically take apart the Quran and figure out whether it lives up to its extraordinary claims as a perfectly preserved book originating in the middle of the 7th century. Let me stop this real quick and read this out. Five Leiden researchers have been awarded a consolidator grant by the European Research Council. This grant, up to 2 million euros, will enable them to continue and expand their scientific research. The ERC consolidator grant is awarded to promising researchers of any age and nationality with between 7 and 12 years of postdoctoral experience. They can use the grant of up to 2 million euros to fund a team of core researchers and support staff over a five-year period. So this is extremely impressive, of course, but we have to clarify the 2 million euros are not only for the one scholar, but they gave him 2 million euros to conduct further research, which makes this whole claim even more grandiose, because it means they really want to dissect the Quran from every possible angle and engage a whole team into the matter. This is quite interesting. Entry. Before we get to what his analysis revealed, it's worth quickly going over the standard Muslim timeline. This gives us a frame of reference to compare the professor's scholarship against. In 610 CE, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, receives his first revelation. In 632 CE, the Prophet وسلم, passes away and all revelation ceases. By now, the Qur'an has been entirely memorized and inscribed on various perishable material. In 632 CE, um, from various written material and men's hearts, Khalif Abu Bakr anhu gathers the Qur'an into a single book, Mus'haf. Note, the Prophet died this very same year. On the That's 25th year of the Hijra, 647 CE, Uthman anhu standardizes the Qur'an back to 
Qurayshi dialect throughout the Muslim lands. The period between the Prophet ﷺ death and standardization of Qur'an is about 15 years. Now, bear this in mind. This is the crux. Bear in mind that no other religion has anything that can compare to this. According to the Muslim sources, None. the Qur'an was standardized by about 647 Uthman. CE by the third caliph, Uthman radiallahu anhu. And it is this claim that's being tested today. Now, one last important thing before we get to the professor's remarkable findings. What does standardization actually mean? Well, from the time of the Prophet ﷺ to the third caliph, Uthman radiallahu anhu, a 15-year period, the Qur'an could be recited in seven Arabic dialects called Ahruf. Exactly, and this is what the Islamophobes use against Islam. They say that there are many different versions, however, those are just dialects. Now, this doesn't mean seven different Qur'ans. Exactly. It means the seven readings of the Qur'an are the same. But there are it. minute dialectical differences in how certain words are pronounced and spelt. This flexibility existed to assist the non quraysh Arabs with their recitation. What's important to remember is these seven readings are mentioned in authentic ahadith, and so they're a part of the canonical readings of the Qur'an. They're not corruptions, and they certainly don't impact the theology. So straight away, they're setting up Marine Van Putin as being a respectable scholar, but then <laughs> when they start to go into the details of his research, they, they have to real, like rem remind their audience that there is actually seven aruf, and yes, uh, the Quran is revealed in these seven different ways, but don't worry about it. It's just dialects. It's just dialects, guys. Don't worry about it. And they all disappeared anyway because it was standardized in the Croatia dialect, so it's totally fine. <laughs> and and I like how notice that Bobby immediately starts going into the whole Islamophobes are using this thing. Basically, throughout this video, he's going to refer to Islamophobes a lot. It's a character attack of anyone who's critical of Islam, which is weird because. Miriam Van Putin is critical of Islam in the same sense he's critical of, well, anything academic because that's kind of his job. And yet they're trying to twist and manipulate what he is saying to make it sound like he's affirming that he was paid two million to find mistakes in the Quran and then confirmed that he didn't find mistakes and that the Quran has been preserved. There's no issues. Everyone can go home. The Islamophobes have been defeated. You know, the, the typical Islamic claim by most apologists on the internet these days. But after hand-waving that roof as if that's not an issue and the six out of seven different valid readings or variants of the Quran have not been lost in some sense, he then carries on. So the standardization process was basically Caliph Uthman al Anhu restoring the Quranic recitation back to the main Quraysh dialect, always the most popular one that the Qur'an was originally revealed in. Of course, Why? because Prophet Muhammad wasallam comes from the Qurayshi tribe. Why? Because by about 647 CE, the different Arabic dialects were starting to confuse the new Muslims joining the growing caliphate. Now to our academic, a leader in the field of historical linguistics, who specializes in the linguistic history of Arabic, Berber and Semitic. Marin Van Putin, PhD 2013 of Leiden University who focuses his research on the textual history of the Quran and the early They're history showing his phone number. I don't think that's a good idea. of the Quranic reading traditions. For your information, he's not a Muslim and his only motivation is to subject the earliest Quran manuscripts to the historical critical so method. As objective so as the gets. two million euro question. Has the Qur'an been faithfully preserved? Because that's the bold Drum claim roll. Islam makes, right? Quote, Verily, we, it is we who have sent down the dhikr, and surely we will guard it from corruption. So again, they want a big Marine Van Putin up by saying, look, he's not a Muslim. Like, this guy isn't trying to evangelize to you. He is someone who is purely from a neutral perspective. He is an academic. He's looking into this academically to find mistakes in the Quran, which is not at all what Moran Van Putin is doing here. They then talk about Surah 15, Ayah 9, where it says that Allah, in some sense, will preserve his words. Keep that in mind, because this is quite an interesting claim that the Quran makes. That Allah will preserve his words. But exactly how will he do this? I would argue that... If Allah is preserving his words, and this is some sort of perfect preservation, then that would also have to include dialects. That would also have to include 
any variance at all. In fact, there couldn't be variance because a variant that is considered by Islamic scholars to be a part of the Qur'at or the valid ten readings would either mean one or two things. Either Muhammad said both these things, which there is no sooner to validate, or... Muhammad said one thing, but then through the period of time, a variant has appeared that has now been accepted as a canonized form of the Quran, namely in the Ten Qur'at. For this, but if you look at the text, really look at the text and look at the early manuscripts, not many people are looking at them. The first thing that will strike you is that how similar they are. They are extremely similar. I mean, it's really a totally different story than, than with the New Testament, but even, you know, with, with like the early, early uh, Hebrew Bible stuff, it's, it's much, much more chaotic. You can sense the surprise Chaotic. in the professor's voice, you can't you, in terms of what he's encountered with these manuscripts. It was clearly a surprise. Yes, of course it was a surprise because if you look into the Christian sources, into the New Testament, for example... Notice as well, there is a frequent reference to Christianity. Everything in this video is going to contrast Islam and Christianity. Which is weird, really, given that this has nothing to do with Christianity at all. It's purely about what Marin van Puden has done academically regarding Quranic Arabic. Nothing to do with Greek. Literally nothing to do with Greek. <laughs> But anyway, he's going to make these comparisons because he needs to, because Islam is in its final death knell and it needs something to latch onto. And Christianity is always the thing they do. They try to make comparisons. The earliest gospel could be Mark, and that was 70 years after Jesus. 70 years? 70 years? You think that the gospel of Mark was written around 103 AD. Bobby, I think you need to read some more books about that. I don't think there's any scholar that thinks that Mark was written in the second century. Well, I say any scholars, any any main scholars or reputable scholars think that Mark was written in the second century. There's pretty much consensus that John came after Mark, for example. Realize as well that this is just cope in a sense. Christians find it very suspicious that the early Islamic claim is that the Quran was compiled by one guy and his team of scribes 20 years after Muhammad died. That to us is quite difficult, especially when the Sunnah says that he burnt Quranic materials that he did not include into his Quranic corpus, into the Quran that he compiled. We didn't have such a thing in the Christian world. We didn't have some guy saying, hey, you know what? Give me all the books of the Bible and I'm just going to go through them, decide what I like, what I don't like, and I'm going to burn the stuff I don't like. I'm then going to say, after I finished this book, that anyone who has something different to this needs to be punished and to put severe punishments for those who continue to push a different style of codex from what I've published. And yeah, you guys just have to trust me that I totally did the right thing and didn't disregard any potentially viable information or variants or sauras or verses or anything like that. Keep in mind, the Quran was still in only one language at this point. It was still in Arabic. So in other words, you can't go to other languages to validate that the material that Uthman lost wasn't actually that important. In fact, scholars don't know what information was lost, to be brutally honest. There's still speculation about exactly what they could be. Because the Quranic materials were only in Arabic, it's harder to validate what that material might have been. But in the Christian perspective, it was very early on translated into different languages. Therefore, from an early perspective, you can compare manuscripts from different languages. And if there's a general consensus on what is written, then you can say, well, we're fairly happy that there wasn't some mass kind of change happening. That process is embedded in Islam. The mass change in the text in Islam starts from almost the beginning. It starts from 20 years after Muhammad died, where there was a committee put together to make the Quran as we know it today. We know from Abdullah ibn Masud and Nabi ibn Ka'b that they had different codexes with different surahs in. There are the five surahs that are in doubt in Islamic scholarship, Surah Fatiha, Surah Nas, and the others of which there is questions about whether or not they should be actually in the Quran. Uthman standardized it and gave us an answer. Was that the right answer? I don't know. Depends who you ask. There were other companions that said it wasn't. Absolutely no comparison to the Islamic preservation. By way of comparison, he mentions the Zero. Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. But it's clear the Quran is in a league of its own. And then you look at the Quran and it's just, it's the same thing over and over again. It's not just the same thing, you know, like in, in general lines. No, it's down, not just down to the words, it's down to the spellings, right? Even the specific spellings and sometimes really random spellings are copied faithfully over and over again. Sometimes a word can be spelled in two ways, but they'll always write in one place, in one way, in the other place, in another way. And you don't get any mixing in that early manuscript. So really, um, scribes took, took the utmost care to really carefully uh, 
copy these manuscripts. Notice again more attacks on Christians and comparisons between the preservation of the Quran and the preservation of the Bible. They always want to do this, and the reason this falls flat, and they're hoping you don't notice this, is remember the verse I said earlier? Quran, Surah 15, Ayah 9. There is a misconception and a theologically co-opted misconception that the Quran is perfectly preserved, letter for letter, word for word, dot for dot. And we've known that academics have said this. We know that popular da'is, people at Speaker's Corner, people online, they've all repeated this mantra. But all this is doing is trying to make the Quran in a different league from the Bible. When in fact, there's a lot of parallels. The main differences are in terms of how it was canonized. The Quran had one guy and his team do it and burn all the other stuff. The Bible didn't have that same kind of process. It was much more organic for the biblical uh, biblical books. But in order to make them seem like they're not at that level, they raise the bar and they say, ah, this is a Quran verse that says Allah will protect his words. Therefore, this is the Quran it's talking about. And this means that it's preserved letter for letter, word for word, dot for dot. Don't worry about it. There are no variants. Everything we've got, everything we've canonized is absolutely spot on. And this is a very weak position for Da'is to take, for Muslim apologists to take, because they have to deal with the question of the Aruf, which is the seven ways of recitation that Muhammad recited in that have now seemingly lost, which seems that that would be valid Quran recitation if Muhammad said it and he said it was Quran. Again, to my knowledge, there isn't a scholarly answer to this. There's not even a consensus as to whether or not how much of it was lost or has all of it but one half been lost or has it all been preserved somehow? But if it's been preserved, then where is it? And how do you know what it is and how to identify it? Well, that's another question. This is fine if the average Muslim simply simply wants to say, there is a sense in which the Quran has been preserved. Here's how we go about demonstrating that. And I think Moran Vin Putin has a very good point when he says, yeah, you can look at preservation and generally speaking, we can trace this back to a Uthmanic codex type and we can see that he follows it pretty faithfully. The Ten Kalat, for example, follow the Uthmanic codex type, the, the rasm that we have in the Uthmanic codex. That I think is perfectly fine. It's when Muslim apologists get a bit sneaky and they start to add other things. It's been preserved so amazingly. There are no issues with it. It's just a... It, this could only come from Allah. Really? First of all, there was a lot of material that was lost very early on. Second of all, the Aruf problem, I don't think actually has an answer or ever will have an answer. So that's potentially six out of seven different valid ways of reciting that are now lost. That's 85% roughly of the Quran. Again, is that does that mean it hasn't been preserved? No, it just means it hasn't been preserved perfectly. It means that there are issues in preservation where there are verses that are in doubt, there is ayah, that there is disagreement over by very popular imams, a lot of them of whom were those who were reciting the kala'at, the rawiyah of Hafs or the rawiyah of Wash. They don't fully conform on everything. And this is the research that Marim Van Putin puts on his Twitter feed, you know, <laughs> for people like me just to go on and read and be like, huh, he says that this is different to this. Yeah, that's not perfect preservation. Anyway, let's move on. Now, here's, here's the beauty of this. He has to explain a glaring problem here, a big problem. Why is it that this respectable, reputable, knowledgeable academic who knows Arabic, who looks into the Quranic Arabic and evaluates it, including the different Qurans, the different 10 recitations, he supposedly, and remember, we heard that the guy, the guy who's narrating this, uh, the Muslim paradigm, he said perfect preservation, and they can't let go of perfect preservation, because it's the only way they have to differentiate themselves in a meaningful sense, theologically speaking, from the biblical text. Otherwise, you're just dealing with questions of preservation, normal preservation. And they are clinging on with everything they've got because they don't want to give this polemic up. They want to keep lying. They want to say perfect preservation. They want to say letter for letter, word for word, dot for dot. Even if it kills them, that is the hill they're going to die on. Even when scholars like this openly say, well, what do you mean by perfectly? What does perfectly mean in this context? To talk about perfect transmission, it seems kind of obvious there would be better ways. You know, can Tawata be established perfectly? No. Are there, is, the, is the science of the, uh, the Isnad chain trying to establish Tawata, is that perfect? Doesn't seem like it. So what sense is this perfect? But Bobby's perspective has to explain, and so does the Muslim paradigm and whoever else is commenting on this video, why, and this is the million dollar question, or maybe it's a two million dollar question, why has Marin Van Putin not become a Muslim after discovering this? He's just discovered, supposedly, the Quran is perfectly preserved. Why has he not become a Muslim? The answer, ladies and gentlemen, is incredibly simple. It's because he doesn't think 
in any meaningful sense, that the Quran is perfectly preserved and therefore from God. That's not his field here. That's not what he's trying to achieve. And he himself hasn't gotten that impression. But we don't need to take my perspective here. We can actually go to Marin Van Putin himself. It turns out Marin Van Putin knew about this. He knew about these videos being made and he made a post on Twitter where he elaborated more and to be bl completely blunt, he absolutely rejected this. He said, look, in the past few months, you may have run into videos about Marin Van Putin, who was paid $2 million to find mistakes in the Quran and was shocked by what he found. Just absolutely shocked. So was I? No. <laughs> Till there, it's intentional lies, half-truths, and poor fact-checking. I'm sorry, did, did Marin Van Putin just call the Muslim paradigm and Bobby's perspective intentionally lying. Huh. It's interesting how these days go from jumping on a bandwagon to misquote a scholar, to praise him up, to be like, this guy's got it right, he's done his research, it's amazing, he's proven the Quran is perfectly preserved, to go, oh, actually, um, yeah, that same scholar just called us all liars. Oh. <laughs> so he says it's a mix of intentional lies, half-truths, and poor fact-checking. Am I surprised by this? No. In fact, I could have just looked at this video and already told you they take things out of context. In fact, I've done a previous video where I talked about how there's a history in Muslim apologetics to do this exact kind of thing. It's to get scholars to say things that they can then quote mine to then make material out of. I mean, this goes back many decades now, back when it wasn't really the internet. It was like pamphlets they could hand out with written text on it saying, this scientist said the Quran must be from divine origin. Okay, is that scientist a Muslim? No. <laughs> no, he uh, he's actually still a pastor at a church. <laughs> uh, or no, he's actually still an atheist. He's, he's actually still a hardcore atheist. <laughs> this is nothing new. We know dawa marketing. We know these guys get money for this. So they will say anything. And if they have to drag a scholar through the mud to get him to say what they want him to say, they will do this. This is... Dawa, ladies and gentlemen. The video and derivatives have been going viral for a couple of months now, racking up hundreds of thousands of views on YouTube and millions on Instagram. There is even a German version. <laughs> These guys are even translating this. <laughs> They've got the Dawa marketing team so, so nailed down. They're actually producing translations of it already. There's an English version, a German version. Man, maybe even they'll, they'll get a French version one day, I'm sure of it. The deceitful viral message started with, and again, this is Marim Van Putin saying, it's a deceitful viral message. Started with the YouTube channel, The Muslim Paranoid. I didn't want to reply to this video because it's so insidiously dishonest that I expected it would fly over, which it did at first, but it got picked up on on Instagram and exploded. In other words, the Dow marketing team pressed some buttons, shifted that lever up, and started the propaganda machine that is Dawa marketing. The Dean Show very responsibly shared that version with his one million followers. Oh dear. Not good. Not good, guys. And he, and he actually shows you the video as well. I'm now getting daily emails, texts from randoms, old students, friends, and colleagues, and friends who ran into these videos asking what's going on. I'm happy many people who felt like something didn't add up and thought to search or ask me, but for them, millions of others, yes, those millions of probably predominantly Muslims who have been lied to by the Dawa marketing paradigm. Let's go through this claim by claim. Number one, Marin received a 2 million grant from the European Research Council. That's correct for my Khan, I believe that's how it's pronounced, project, which is a five-year project involving two postdocs, two PhD students, and myself. The project is still ongoing, started January 1st, 2023. Two, I received this grant in order to find mistakes in the Quran. Original video formulates it a bit more carefully than its clickbaity title, but it's still equally wrong. This nuance was lost in later derivatives. No, this is not the goal of the Quran project at all. So no, he wasn't paid two million to find mistakes in the Quran. That's not the intent. This can be found out quite easily by typing ERC Van Putin in Google. The project aims to find out how the Quran was recited before the canonization of the seven, that's the seven Qur'at by Ibn Mujahid in the 10th century, and how the seven became authoritative by looking at early vocalized manuscripts. Wow. Wow. So it has more to do with looking at how there are different readings of the Quran before Ibn Mujahid standardized seven different Qur'at, seven different readings. And he wanted to look at how the Quran was being recited before that. And how is it that we ended up with seven authoritative ones and we dismissed the others? Nothing to do <laughs> with some weird theological claim of, is there any mistakes in the Quran? There cannot be any mistakes in the Quran. Or Miriam Van Putin going on a mission to find these mistakes. 
and finding instead that the Quran was perfectly preserved. Nope, nothing to do with that. That was just a lie. My analysis in the ERC project showed that the Quran contains no mistakes. <laughs> oh no. This is, of course, absurd. The project started this January and is set to run for five years. There are no results yet, and in any case, it's not about finding mistakes at all. He hasn't even done this yet. They're literally telling you, think about this, Muslims, they have been telling you that Marin Van Putin has concluded his research by saying that if the crime is perfectly preserved, there are no mistakes. He's not even done it yet. <laughs> he's done one year out of five, and they're already like, he's already done it. Nothing else to find. All done. All done. The video, <laughs> the videos they show were from obviously before this. So oh, you see the level of disingenuousness. If if they were really being honest, because they knew this, right? They did their research. They were looking at his videos and looking at what he was saying, looking at the the Kukan project and what that was. They would have known it ran for five years. They would have known it's nowhere near finished yet. They would have waited and waited, or at least premised it by saying, "Hey." This is what he has found so far. They never do that in these videos because there is no intent on being truthful. There is only intent on the DAO marketing machine to pump out as much nonsense as they can, make it viral by making crazy claims and then hoping the lies can run faster than the truth. That is sad. That upsets me, genuinely. Now he goes on to say what he actually thinks about grammatical mistakes. He talks about how he thinks the youth manic text was a very stable text in that, yes, these Kul'at, these variants do seem to generally come from this Uthmanic text. But again, Da'is are not interested in Marian Van Putin saying it's preserved as a way you can argue for preservation. They want perfect preservation. They want, there is no theological contesting the idea that the Quran is not from God. This is absurd and it's religious claims over academic claims. But they want to take those religious claims and put it in the mouth of Marian Van Putin even though he's not a Muslim. Suspicious much. And of course he points out what we have known in biblical scholarship for a long time. This actually says nothing about the presence of mistakes or not. The whole point of precise copying is that you also copy any mistakes that are in the text. So if there would be a scribal error or some other mistake in the original, it would be accurately copied. Yeah. I mean, we know that the Uthmanic Codex, and Marin actually says this as well, the Uthmanic Codex is not a single reading. There are actually variations in the Uthmanic Codex that were given to different regions. And we know this because early Islamic sources talk about that. Is that a mistake or is that intentional? Interesting question. Marin concludes with the following. So, fake news. It's deceitful and it is not an honest mistake. I told the original maker that it was dishonest and that he should take it down. But he was too interested in the worldly gains of his YouTube channel to consider honesty and continued plastering it everywhere. But how funny that Bobby's perspective and all these other YouTube channels that were publishing this video, trying to encourage Muslims, have just been refuted by the very person they were quoting. How beautiful. So what can we take away from this video? Be very skeptical when you see Muslims claim scholars that affirm the preservation of the Quran because they're almost never going to say this scholar affirms in a general sense we can say that most of the Quran is preserved. They will never, never admit this because to admit this is to admit that their perfect preservation letter for letter, word for word, dot for dot, halakha for halakha, that lie is a lie. And they can't admit this. So they have to keep telling you this scholar just affirm the Quran is perfectly preserved. Not only did the scholar never even use the word perfect, Maureen Van Putin's pinned Twitter post actually even calls into question as to what that term really means. So why on earth would you think he'd be using it? Ultimately, I think the Islamic perspective is going to follow the same, same trend as the Christian one has been doing for the last 300 years. We believe that the message inspired through the Holy Spirit and written by man is preserved. A text is merely a text, and a copyist is merely a copyist. To suggest that Allah or God sends lightning bolts down whenever a copyist makes a scribal error, that's not what we mean by preservation in this sense. The Christians believe the message has been preserved. Christians sit very comfortably in this. Muslims are in a very shaky position because sooner or later they're going to have to admit they've been lying to people about how the Quran's perfectly preserved. It isn't. But will you ever hear them admit that? Well, I think maybe one day they will. Maybe one day. Hopefully in my lifetime, but you know, if we keep making these videos, maybe, maybe it'll get to them and they'll be like, hey, we gotta give this up. The Quran is obviously not perfectly preserved. Someone called Dr. Yasakari. Thanks for watching this video. As always, Christ loves you. He draws you to him. No one comes to the Father except through him. There is eternity of peace and love and truth waiting for you through the open arms of our Lord. God bless you all. I hope you have a great day. Take care.